I used to have a big crush on Little Mermaid until Big D just ruined it by getting creepy. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What about the vagina? The vagina conversation? Yeah, what other creepy thing did you say about Little Mermaid other than the vagina conversation? <laughs> the fact that you had a vagina conversation about a Disney character is enough right there. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane came down. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast that asks, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Gene Lyons, and alongside me is my co-host, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And tonight we have a special guest, Drew Zachman. I don't believe that man's ever gone to medical school. And together we're going to take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices, and we break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of the podcast, the three of us will provide the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off our respective bums. So find a comfortable spot on the sofa and accompany us for a journey through our vast VHS movie collections. If you'd like to download Chat the Movies, you can subscribe via iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Drew, really glad to have you on the podcast tonight. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Before I talk about me, I just wanted to say thank you guys for you know consistently putting out you know great content. I've been listening to you guys for uh, at least a year, probably a little bit longer than that. Uh, and I know the amount of work it takes to go into a podcast. So uh, thank you guys for everything that you do. Uh, it's it's greatly appreciated, and it definitely doesn't go unnoticed. Um, so, so my podcast, which is the One Headlight 90s podcast, we talk about all things 90s, uh, from 90s music to sports to movies, video games. I'll cover off on all of those topics. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of my best 90s soundtrack segment. And right after that, I'm doing an episode explaining why Godsmack has completely ripped off Alice in Chains. So if you really like Godsmack, maybe don't listen to that one or hmm. maybe listen to it. Uh, could be enlightening. Not sure. Could go either way. But in any event, other topics I've covered off on are one hit wonders, 90s sport topics like baseballs, Super Bowls in 90s. Uh, also did an episode on top 10 90s guitarists. Uh, so I have a bunch of good stuff coming up. So Drew's first podcast I listened to was actually his first podcast, and it was about Beauty and the Beast. And he brought up a lot of the problems that I have with Disney movies and princesses. And right away, I said, this is this is funny. This is pretty good. So I, I reached out to Drew and said, Drew, we have a category that's coming up that would be perfect for you. Uh, I said, would you want to sit in? And he said, yes, because the category was the best of Disney animated classics. Uh, it was recommended by one of our listeners, Emma Ebert from Orlando, Florida. Thank you, Emma, for listening. And in last place, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Beauty and the Beast at number five, The Little Mermaid, number four, Aladdin, number three. The Lion King at two, and that leaves only one Disney slash Pixar movie, the 1995 classic Toy Story. Yeah, Aladdin was robbed on this one, you guys. It is the greatest animated film of all time, and I'm not saying that just because it's Persian. Uh, in fact, that would be something that detracted from the quality of the film, but this is totally unfair, you guys. Uh, Toy Story is good, but come the fuck on. Get real. Yeah, I, I actually have to agree. Uh, Aladdin was always my favorite Disney movie growing up. I would say Lion King probably second. Little Mermaid, mm -hmm. uh, Ariel. She's so terrible. She really is. And Belle, she sucks. Uh, sorry, guys. She, they're, they're, they are easily my <laughs> least favorite Disney princesses ever. I like, I like to say sorry, guys. Like, There's just a bunch of <laughs> listeners that just sat up in their chairs. We're like, yeah, what the you. fuck, Drew? Fuck Come on. this podcast. This is bullshit. I had I had a discussion with somebody at work who was like a huge fan of Little Mermaid. I don't know why she was like she's actually a little bit older than I am, but whatever, that's fine. And man, she got she was livid with me when I started listing the pages of issues I have with Ariel. She completely disagreed. So uh, maybe there's other people out there like that. I don't know. I used to have a big crush on Little Mermaid until Big D just ruined it by getting creepy. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what about the vagina? The vagina conversation? 
Yeah, what other creepy thing did you say about the Little Mermaid other than the vagina conversation? <laughs> the fact that you had a vagina conversation about a Disney character is enough right there. Well, I didn't have to go into the lyrics. Darling, it's better. Down where it's wetter. Take it from me. <laughs> no, I'm talking about when when Ariel gives up her, her, her fin for leg, she appears on the rock in front of Eric. She now has legs. So I said, doesn't that mean now she's anatomically correct? Wouldn't she be like, oh, what's this? Eric looks up, sees that. She gets the kiss of love right there. Boom, movie's over. But we don't know, though, because when she signs a contract, she's just signing for legs. Obviously, she clearly doesn't read the fine print. Oh. But maybe she doesn't have one. We don't know. I, Ursula maybe just followed her order. She's <laughs> like, I want legs. That's all you get, legs. The tiniest of clams. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right, Toy Story. So for those who haven't seen Toy Story, and I don't think that person even exists, uh, it's a computer animated film series produced by Pixar Animation Studios and released by Disney Pictures. The franchise is based on an anthropomorphic concept that all toys, unknown to humans for like the first hour, are secretly alive. It started a franchise of three films produced on a total budget of $320 million that have grossed more than $1.9 billion worldwide. Each film set box office records with the third included in the top 15 all-time worldwide films. All three films have received generally positive reviews from critics and audiences, and a fourth film is set for release in June of this year. The series is the 24th highest grossing franchise worldwide, the fifth highest grossing animated franchise behind Despicable Me, Shrek, Ice Age, and Madagascar, and it's among the most critically acclaimed trilogies of all time. On November 1st, 2011, all three Toy Story films were released as a trilogy pack and as individual films. Despicable Me, Shrek, Ice Age, and Madagascar have made more money than the entire Toy Story franchise. How is that possible? I could see maybe Shrek. Shrek's actually kind of deep. I feel like I'll talk about it a little bit later, but Toy Story really kind of started to like ratchet up involving the parents and adults in, the, you know, being interested and invested in the movie. But I feel like Shrek took it a whole other level. I feel like they really cranked it up a notch. But Madagascar, that's I mean, my, my kids love that, but it's garbage. But, but I also think there's like seven Shreks. There's like Shrek's birthday, Shrek's well, that Christmas, hurt. Shrek's Hanukkah. Like they went away from just the traditional movies. So I think they're counting everything. So Drew, every time we bring in a guest, they're typically an expert on something. You clearly are a 90s expert. Uh, what are your memories of the first time you saw Toy Story? So uh, when Toy Story first came out, I was around 15. And I was actually busy playing baseball and getting turned down by girls. So I don't exactly remember the first time I saw it. Uh, I think it was probably on VHS, maybe a year or so after it came out. I can't tell you, however, the last like 10 or so times I've seen it with my two daughters, and it's been great every time. Unfortunately, we've seen The Little Mermaid more times than this, much to my chagrin. So so to a, to a little girl now in 2019, this movie's still relevant. Let's get a pulse check there, actually. It, it still makes sense to them? They get it? Yes. And Big D, has Emma seen Toy Story? No, because she's three, so like The Incredibles... In the slow moments where the the main two characters, where they're having marital problems, Emma just looks at me like, what's going on? I, I want to see people running fast and things exploding. So this is not relevant to Emma right now. She still loves Frozen uh, oh. and any other princess film. Frozen. So I was, uh, I was also 15 when this movie came out. And what's funny is my nephew, he's 15 right now, and I have no idea what, like, is age appropriate for children. I've never understood this. Like when my niece was like 12, I was like, so the wiggles, huh? And she's like, no, I, that's not cool. And then my nephew, when he was like three, I was like, Hey, power Rangers. He's like, I don't know. Uh, so trying to think back to when I was 15, I'm like, Holy shit. When I was 15 is when the King B and I met and we were like you drew, we were interested in girls and going out to clubs and we didn't give a shit about animated films, but I was finally, as always happens with animated movies. I think my entire history of seeing animated movies was at a family event. You know, you get stuck like in the kids room or it's on like on Thanksgiving or something like that. And I remember sitting down much like I did this time and thinking, don't like this movie. Don't like this movie. Don't like this movie. And then you're like, fuck. Okay. It's actually, it's pretty good. So I was a bit older when I first saw this, I was in college. I don't remember what year, but they used to host in the student union. It was dollar movie night and I remember everybody was excited because it was this new cutting edge movie. It was all CGI and people were like, wow, let's go. Now, I 
really don't remember the plot because I was extremely high at that at that time and we were drinking <laughs> in the theater. But I just remember like I, I probably had my mouth opened and was just staring at the screen, drooling. And at the end, we all walked out and was like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And and watching it today, I still respect it. It still looks really good, but there are some giant holes in the CGI. Let's dive right into him, Big D. Hit that trailer. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Establish a recon post downstairs. Code red, repeat. We are at code red. Recon plan, Charlie. Execute. Move, 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 move. It's a... It's a big one. Walt Disney Pictures presents a totally new animated motion picture event. Star Command, come in. Do you read me? The story of two toys. Oh, there seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. Hello? Oh, yeah. ah! Headed for a showdown. My name is Woody. This is my spot. No! I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. You are a child's plaything. You are a sad, strange little man. And playing by their own rules. Draw. Fuck me again. I don't like confrontations. Buzz, look an alien. Where? Ah! You're mocking me, aren't you? <laughs> oh, impressive wingspan. Very good. <laughs> oh, what? What? He can't fly. Yes, I can. Can't. Can. 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 This holiday season, the adventure takes off when toys come to life. To infinity and beyond. Toy Story. Look out! <laughs> A group of toys owned by a boy named Andy Davis, including Bo Peep the Shepherdess, Mr. Potato Head, Rex the Dinosaur, Ham the Piggy Bank, and Slinky Dog, fear they will be replaced by new toys from Andy's birthday party. Sheriff Woody, the toy's leader and Andy's favorite toy, sends out army men to spy on the party and report the gift results to others via baby monitors. The toys are relieved when the party appears to end with none of them being replaced by new toys. But then Andy receives a surprise gift, a Buzz Lightyear action figure who thinks he is a real space ranger. (laughs) So, guys, as you mentioned, Big D, right off the bat, before any of this plot even kicks in, we're getting the opening credits and I'm looking around the screen and I go, 1995? Like, this shit looks incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I think the 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 toys look fantastic. It looks as good as today. But can, can we agree that when they tried to do human beings, all I kept seeing was dancing baby, like the one of the first gifts, and and Andy's little sister Molly. They couldn't put the camera on her for more than fifteen seconds without fear of giving the audience a nightmare. I didn't understand this either because I get that like humans are tougher to do than toys. But it was the modeling they used for the humans. I mean, you made toys that look like people and they looked good. I, it almost felt like they had two separate teams. One yes. team that was like, okay, you fucking nail these toys. And the other team was like, eh, yeah, make a kid. I mean, Andy's head is like, it's fucking misshapen. And also, the, you look at the mouths. Like Woody and Buzz, their mouth looks normal. The baby, you know, Anna, let's just call her Monster Holly. Her mouth is always open. She's got teeth. And she's like, ah! And you can see, like, almost out the back of her head. It's terrifying. Yeah, as she's, like, bashing the crap out of poor Mr. Potato Head. Just slobbering on him. (laughs) Yeah. One of the things that the movie did get right is that they used a lot of familiar toys that all of us kind of grew up with. They didn't go with anything that was, like, trendy. These are all classic toys, right? Everybody knows what a speak and spell is. Everybody knows what a... A Mr. Potato Head is or Army Men. It's things that you would find over decades in every kid's room. Uh, So they did a great job in in giving us a familiar ground to base ourselves in. So everybody's immediately connecting within the first couple minutes of this movie. So so since this was Emma's category, what are some of her favorites always, Big D? Uh, It's probably like an Elsa doll or a uh, or a bunch of tiaras. She likes tiaras. Is she into Paw Patrol at all? Paw Patrol, yeah, of course. She's got those shiny Paw Patrol shoes with Everest and Chase. They light up. I know all the Paw Patrols. I have serious problems with them as well. But uh, I'd rather have her watching that than some of the other like Barbie Caddy teen CGI shows. 
Yeah, guys, I consider myself a pretty smart guy. I got kicked off of College Jeopardy because I was getting too many things right. Oh. I have no idea what the hell Paw Patrol is. Humble brag. Oh, Paw Patrol. Uh, apparently, it's uh, it's an 11-year-old kid rider who somehow is in charge of all of the safety and the police and also like the firefighting in this town. I forget the name of the town's called. Uh, was it uh, Adventure Bay or something like that? He also has uh, uh, unlimited funds because... The property he has, the housing he has, and the machinery he has, like all the cars and stuff. I want to know where Ryder gets his money from. Okay, so so Drew is glossing over the fact here that all of the characters that are protecting this town are puppies. Well, well, yeah. So the police is a puppy. His name is Chase. The fire chief, his name is Marshall. Uh, Sky is the female pilot. People in town don't seem concerned that these puppies are operating machinery. I like that you guys just flipped my opinion in in one split second. I was like, that show sounds like it sucks. Wait, there's puppies? Okay, I'm in. I I just feel like maybe I'm biased because I'm an old man now, but like I feel like our toys were just fucking better. Like my favorite toys were the um, obviously G.I. Joe's, but the the original Star Wars toys that had like the lightsabers that were hidden in their arms and they weren't all buff. They were just like normal shaped dudes. Mm -hmm. Those fucking ruled. So speaking of buff toys, uh, I had plenty of those and they were called oh. He-Man toys. And those things were fantastic. The names were even better. There was uh, Ram Man, who was one of my favorites. And I think the one guy's name was like Fisto. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> his his special power was, was, yeah, something for adults. <laughs> it's actually when Big D and I go clubbing, that's what we go as. We're Ram Man and Fisto. Ram Man was the one he had like the spring-loaded legs, right? Yes, uh-huh. yes. Yeah, like a yeah, steel yeah. head. Yeah, anytime that dude would show up in a He-Man cartoon, they would always get trapped in a cave or like behind rubble so he could be like useful and bang it out with his head. I like the Skeletor that had like the uh, the battle damage chest yeah, plate. Those are cool. Where he tapped it and it would flip. That was cool as shit. Absolutely. I also really liked uh, uh, Thundercats. Those are badass. Yeah, if I can recommend something, and I'm going to assume that Drew has watched this. Netflix has, I think it's the toys that defined us or the toys that made us. And each yes. episode tells you the history of how a toy was created uh, how it fell, you know, how it became popular, and then it, how it eventually failed. They do things like Star Wars, Barbie, Lego, He Man. It's amazing to sit and watch, and you see a lot of these. One of them they did was Star Wars, and GI Joe I loved, but Star Wars. My parents came to visit about a month ago and brought my original Millennium Falcon. It is in one piece. I was only missing uh, the ball with the with the rope and the little hidden compartment cover. They also found my snow speeder. I have also my light bike from Tron. Uh, and and those toys are some of my most prized possession. Besides Zartan and his little swamp bike, I got all the pieces. Nice. I saw the, I think it was the He-Man one, the He-Man episode on that Netflix mm-hmm. series. That was pretty awesome. The story was pretty crazy too. So I also highly recommend that. But uh, one of my favorite toys, starting lineups. I love those things. Uh, it was like, gi joe's for sports like for athletes basically i still have a bunch of them around my wife despises the fact that i still have them so sorry sweetheart uh, but yeah those are those are some great toys uh, before we move on to the next topic i know people are screaming at their radios right now transformers guys like that was the apex toy that was oh, the best toy in anybody's no. toy bin no they what? were are you fucking kidding they me? weren't all scaled the same size that's my problem I want Optimus and Bumblebee and Star Screamer. And what about the fucking size of Megatron? You see how big he is? What hand is going to harry that gun? Big D, you're like a you're like a middle aged five year old. Like <laughs> I'd love to play with these toys, but the scaling is completely inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. So on Toy Story, we get a, a you know we get the full span of toys. You got the Slinky Dog. Uh, you got um, you know the Army Men. The leader is uh, Woody, who is a, a cowboy doll, which is, I think, about as classic a toy as you can get. Um, he's portrayed as the hero, but I don't see it this way as, after watching it as an adult. I wonder if it's because it's Tom Hanks's voice. And everybody thinks Tom Hanks is, he's Mr. Nice Guy. You know, Tom Hanks should play a serial killer once just to throw us all off. But when he voices Woody, you're like, oh, he's so nice. But Woody acts like he's the fucking king. He is the dictator of Andy's room. And I found myself wondering, I'm like, who elected him to be in charge of the toys? Because nobody questions him. Everyone follows his orders. He has control of the military. He actually calls in a recon team to go out there and nobody questions it. I'm like, 
Is it simply because if you're Andy's favorite toy, you become king of the toys? What do we think like a toy power structure looks like? I would I would say yeah, except for we clearly see a toy coup happen, and it's it's at the slightest thing, man. Like this is the slightest. This is thing. a this is a South American government at best. They're just like, oh, you threw a guy out the window, fucking rebel. <laughs> so I mean, if you call attempted murder the slightest thing, then yeah, yeah, dude. What's what's funny is if you ever watch, uh, they have the original pitch to the Disney executives that they did, and the storyboard had the voices. It had Tom Hanks. It had Tim Allen. And in that, Woody was dark and it wasn't an accident. He intentionally pushed Buzz out the window. When the other toys confront him, he says, what's done is done and closes the window. And Disney was like the Pixar. I don't think this is the right tone we're going for. Here, at least, Woody pretends like it was an accident. This is why we should never get Disney involved in anything. It would have been so much cooler if if Woody just owned it (laughs) because buds i mean he's not a malevolent force he comes in okay he's just he's so fucking out of it that again you feel bad for him because he's a non-threat but i don't know why woody's being such a dick it's obvious all the toys have been going through this at some point i'm gonna assume right that all the toys start out like buzz they think they're real then they slowly ease into the world that they're in that they're not living characters you know, and then at some point they have a coming to Jesus where they realize, hey, we're just toys. But for some reason, Woody enjoys just ripping the bandaid off of poor Buzz. You're not a toy. You're not a toy. How about I have some sympathy? Ease him into this. I, I, it's it's starting to sound like toy prison. <laughs> like, you know, this like is, Buzz shows yeah. up and he's just like, I'm innocent. They're like, yeah, sure. You're fine. We're all innocent, Buzz. <laughs> You know, but I think what it is is Woody is he. You notice on his body that he's kind of aging a little bit. His guns not there. His legs are kind of like wobbly. I think it's really the sort of the story of uh, kind of like like whatever happened to Baby Jane. He's just like he's afraid of the fact that he's losing his luster. Dude, his whole world's coming to an end, and the cap on. I think what pushed him over the edge to try to murder Buzz was when Bo Peep started giving some attention to uh, to Buzz. Woody did not like that. More like ho peep. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have that written down? <laughs> Come on, you didn't just walk into that. No, it's your editing that made me funny. Oh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but yeah, so one of the things I noticed, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but I watched, I actually think I watched this a lot when I was a kid, but there was a movie called The Christmas Toy. Uh, it came out like mid to late 80s. I think it was a Jim Henson movie. It's it's almost like the I the same plot. There was a toy. I think it was like a cat or a, like a like a toy tiger or something like like a stuffed tiger. And he was like last year's Christmas toy. And then all of a sudden they're getting to this year's Christmas, and there are the new toys there. And the new toys are going to be like like the popular toy to play with for the kid. And I think one of them is even like a like a space type toy, like a space queen or something like that. But. When I when we were talking about when I was thinking about toys and what like notes to take, that made me think about that movie. And I was like, wait, these plots are actually super similar here. And that movie was actually a bit darker because when I think it was like a like a toy mouse, whenever they're actually seen moving by humans, they actually like freeze and they die. So that movie was a little bit darker. A little bit darker. That's dark as fuck. A lot lot darker. (laughs) <laughs> I think in naming a movie the Christmas toy, you can guarantee I wouldn't watch it. Like as a child, I'd be like, that's that is the most boring movie. And they should have called it Toys Die When You Look at Them. I would have been like, oh, I'll, I'll watch that. I thought it was the movie where uh, where that rich white kid decides to buy a black man with Richard Pryor. That's just the toy. Yeah, that's I thought that's what it was. That movie's fucking phenomenal. Is it really? <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Anything with Richard Pryor is good, man. You know what sucks though? Oh, I know it sucks. <laughs> Fucking Randy <laughs> Newman. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I know Raj is a big fan of Randy Newman. I don't understand how this guy has a music career. I maybe I mean, listen, the the sound editing and the score of this movie are fantastic. I think that the score is very gripping. The sound editing's better than some live action stuff I've seen. I mean, you really feel like every percussive beat, every scratch, every scrape, every beep and boop of every toy, like it all sounds very, very real. But then you got this asshole. Up there singing, and I'm thinking, this is a kids' movie. Why the hell would you hire Randy Newman, who is like the patron saint of like Cubs fans or some shit? 
God, I, I, I think you calling Randy Newman a musician is the most generous thing you've said this whole podcast. He is Jimmy Buffett. He just speaks lyrics about what's going on. Oh, there's a man over there. And I don't know why Disney would pick him. I went back and looked up some of his lyrics, okay? His number one song was Short People. And these are the lyrics. Short people got no reason. Short people got no reason to live. They got little hands, little eyes. They walk around telling great big lies. Okay. That's his number one song, making fun of uh, the vertically challenged. Wait, that song was a bigger hit than I Love LA? A hundred percent. That was a song that people knew him for. You figure, would Randy now, after Toy Story, would he kind of mellow out? A song on Randy's new album is called Korean Parents. And these lyrics (laughs) are real. You ready? Some Jewish kids still trying. Some white kids trying too. (laughs) Millions of real American kids don't have a clue. Korean parents still say, say you need a little discipline, someone to whip you into shape. That is Randy Newman. That is Korean parents. And that is real. Randy Newman. uh, Randy Newman lyrics sound like if you made a bot read the Wall Street Journal. And then just write its own song. It would come out with the Korean parents. Uh, I kind of like that better, though, than uh, than uh, you got a friend in me. <laughs> Fucking greatest. What if he's saying like there was like he's like Woody's going to kill Buzz. <laughs> he's trying to bang Bo Peep. <laughs> Something like that it would be better. That would be way better. You make it so jazzy. I like it. Yeah. Well, when you sing it like that, obviously it's going to be good. All right, so Buzz impresses the other toys with his various features, and Andy begins to favor him, making Woody feel abandoned. As Andy prepares for a family outing at Pizza Planet, his mother allows him to bring one toy. Woody attempts to trap Buzz behind a desk, but ends up accidentally knocking him out of a window, and we get a Wilhelm scream. It's at 27 Mm -hmm. minutes into the movie. Check it out. Andy takes Woody and leaves for Pizza Planet. When the family stops for gas, Woody finds that Buzz has hitched a ride on their van. They have a fight only to find the family has left without them. They manage to make their way to the restaurant by stowing away on a pizza delivery truck. Buzz then gets them stuck in a crane game where they are won by Andy's toy abusing neighbor, a boy named Sid Phillips. Okay, so if we question Woody's true murderous intentions, after that first murder attempt, where everyone thinks, man, Woody's guilty. We don't want him around. He's a pariah of the toys. And they show up in the gas station. Woody is about to leave Buzz again at the truck stop, a lost toy. And he says, I can't show back up without Buzz. I got to save him. That's the only reason that Woody doesn't abandon his poor friend who still thinks he's in the early stages of Toy Awakening. He's going to leave him at a truck stop. Dude, it's life or death, man. It's life or death. If you if, if Andy gets a new favorite toy, you know, Woody's gonna end up at a garage sale. Like he's gotta take control of his own destiny. So you're saying the toy box is like Game of Thrones? All the toys are cutthroat? No, I'm saying that you have a you have a uh Andy is God, right? And basically, like he decides whether you live or die. And if you, you know, you, you see what happens to Sid's toys, you don't want to end up over there. Yeah. I love when Buzz asked if they still use fossil fuels. Uh, and then also when they're heading to Pizza Planet, they stop at a gas station called Dinoco. So I kind of think that was intentional, perhaps playing on the fossil fuel a bit there. Uh, also, did you know, did you guys notice that regular unleaded gas was a buck twenty nine a gallon? So a uh, quick shout out to uh, 1995 gas prices. Yeah, clearly Pixar was uh, basing this on California prices because in Arizona at the time, it was 99 cents a gallon. And we used to drive, true story, on the weekends, we had nothing to do. We would hop in the car for 99 cents a gallon, and we would drive all the way to California to get Del Taco <laughs> because we didn't have it in Arizona. So we'd drive there, get Del Taco or in and out and then drive back. Fucking the internet didn't solve anything, man. We had plenty to do. <laughs> so after the gas station scene, we end up going to Pizza Planet, which was one of my favorite parts of the movie. I thought it was like really, really inventive. I wanted to go there. It looked cool. Those Those robot guards at the door and... Buzz, of course, still not realizing that he's a toy, thinks that this is like a real spaceport. And then we get to see the famous scene with the claw. Yeah, that that claw scene is great. If you ever watched this movie, which I think you mentioned earlier, most people probably have by this point in time. uh, And at some point in your life, you went to one of those claw machines. I'm guessing there's probably like a 93 or so percent chance that if you won something or you were watching someone who did win something, you said you have been chosen. 
Yeah, I think, you, you know, you mentioned, Gene, that you thought Woody was God. I disagree. The claw is God. All the aliens are saying the claw chooses, the claw chooses who goes. They all stand there obeying it to the point where they they push Buzz up to the top. Or when Buzz is going to get caught by by Sid, they stop Woody from saving him. They said, no, no, God has chosen to take him. I'm sure that somewhere, somewhere has written a college paper about this. Like it's just got something, just got something about it. But a uh, pro tip to all of our teenage listeners out there and preteens as well: uh, if you're really shitty at roller skating, I got a tip for you. So I used to go roller skating all the time for school, and I was really bad at it. And I was always trying to impress girls, and like then I figured out you just go to the claw machine. Fuck roller skating. You win stuff for you. Ask them like, hey, what do you want? You know, like which, which of these toys do you want? And you win that for her. Dude, it's money in the bank. You're the provider. That's why they're going to come to you. But, <laughs> but the the best to- or the best uh, game in the entire arcade was the Alien Whack a Mole. I want to play that with the chest bursters. Yeah, I'm just a fat kid. I just wanted the the slushy mas- machine and the pizza. Um, but but the whole place is rad. And so I started wondering: Is there a real Pizza Planet? Like. I didn't think it was going to be at Disney. I thought someone would have had the idea, like, let's make a space-themed pizza place. And it turns out that in 2018, uh, there used to be a place called Red Rockets Pizza Port in Tomorrowland, which, by the way, like, how the fuck did that name pass the screeners? I don't know. But uh, but they did actually make it into a pizza planet. And the full title of the new restaurant uh, at uh, at Disney is Aliens Pizza Planet, A Better Place. So it's a reference to how the alien toys thought that they go to a better place when they're raptured by the claw of the claw machine. <laughs> uh-huh. So you're getting a little bit of uh, some uh, leftovers vibes here. And uh, yeah, but anyway, Pizza Planet looks awesome. It does not look that awesome in real life. The pizza looks kind of shit. And they didn't really do much to like resurface Red Rockets pizza port. It's still definitely Red Rockets. It Was Disney like kind of putting out feelers early on for for Lucas and, and the Star Wars rights? When Sid is in there and he's tormenting Woody, He's role playing Darth Vader. Was Disney like, hey, George, wink, wink, wink. We we were interested. Talk to us. I think the movie was just flailing for any cultural references it could grab because they were like, hey, 30 year old dads, <laughs> remember Star Wars? Pay attention to this movie. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was very cynical when this movie started because it opens up with like, Every cliche toy joke possible to like army men, army joke, Mr. Potato Head, Potato Head joke, Bo Peep, Bo Peep joke. And once they got that out of their system, they actually set on to the mission of being original and quirky. And this movie is very original and very quirky. It's not quite as cynical and entertaining as today's animated features. I still like the newer stuff. I think it's just like it's darker, more cynical, like stuff like Wreck-It Ralph. You know, I think it's just it's just smarter stuff. But What's amazing about uh, Toy Story is at this point, we're like halfway through the movie already. I'm like, these 80 minutes fly by. And the other thing is, I can't look away from it. You know, a lot of times when we're covering these movies, especially 80s movies and 90s movies, they don't grab your attention like today's movies do. They're just not built for that, right? They were built in a pre-internet age. They weren't really trying to like fight for your attention. This movie... I was halfway through it before I even noticed that there was a rest of the room around me. I was, I was sucked in. Again, going back to the attention to detail, like if, when you if you ever had like those army men toys, like you notice like when do you the toy itself right in the in the middle of it where the mold met for the for the army man toy, it would have like that extra plastic on there. The animators like actually put that in and it was so real. And the, the attention to detail, I think you talked about earlier mm-hmm. was for the toys was spot on. And those army men were were, were no exception. I think it goes well beyond the toys, the wear marks on the windowsill and the, mm. the door handles. They age the world better than anything had been done to this point. I mean, you could see they could render plastic smooth toys. But when you start doing like the door jams that have paint worn off, that's where you see the artistic attention to detail that sets Disney and Pixar. I mean, they're a mile above everybody else. Yeah, and 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 the I think it was Andy's well Andy's mom's car the 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 fabric on the seat you, like the level of detail on that was, was absolutely spot on. So next we see Woody attempt to escape from Sid's house. Buzz finally realizing he's a toy after watching a Buzz Lightyear TV ad and trying and failing to fly out a window sinks into despondency. 
Sid plans to launch Buzz on a fireworks rocket, but his plans are delayed by a thunderstorm. Woody tells Buzz about the joy he can bring Andy as a toy, restoring his confidence. The next day, Woody and Sid's mutant creature toys rescue Buzz just as Sid is about to launch the rocket, and they scare Sid into no longer abusing toys. He runs into his house, screaming in horror. Woody and Buzz leave just as Andy and his family drive away toward their new home. Okay, so I I don't want to continue to take this into dark places, but I feel like I have to. There's a lot of things I didn't question the first time I watched this, okay? Like, do toys feel pain, okay? And I don't know how I feel about this, because Sid's mutant toys, if they feel pain, then they have to lay there and pretend to be toys and suffer Sid's torture in silence. And we know the toys feel the pain. Because Rex says he's torturing them just for fun. And when Slinky is stretched out in the truck, we know they feel physical pain. But in part two, Jesse, she actually feels emotional pain. So can you imagine these toys having to lay there and just take it? So so my question goes even one step darker. If a toy can be hurt and a, a toy can feel pain, a toy could probably die. What happens if a toy dies? Does the child still just continue to play with the toy? <laughs> and then the carcass is just left out in the middle of the other toys when they become awake? See, I think that there's some sort of a metaphysical thing going on here where as long as the kid is playing with the toy, then the toy gets to stay alive. It's when they cease to play with the toy that it fails to exist. It's like it's very American gods, but I feel this is totally unfair to <laughs> Sid. So look at what he actually does, right? He's a kid who finds new and inventive ways to play with his toys. So yeah, he's a dick to his sister, but I mean, what boy isn't? But really look at it. He's like, okay, I got these toys. And instead of being like, I need new toys, he's like, let me give these toys new life. I'm going to, I'm going to get creative. He's playing outside the box. Like he's, he is doing his own thing and like blowing them up or whatever. He doesn't know they feel anything. The second that he does find out that they feel anything, he's, you know, he's horrified and, and, and afraid of them. So it's really on the toys for being hmm. fucking idiots and just laying there the whole time. And unlike a Christmas toy, they don't die if you look at them. Yeah, you, you got me thinking. Maybe we're looking at Sid. We shouldn't look at him like he's sadistic. Maybe he's just poor. Maybe he created the mutant toys out of a necessity. And Andy is the spoiled kid with every toy. And we look at him like the hero. Maybe this movie, we got it all wrong, guys. Yeah, and I think, uh, so there's the scene, right, when Buzz, uh, he's trying to get away from Scud, the dog. He goes into, I don't know if it was like the mom's bedroom, but I think that's where I think we learn a lot about Sid, right? You know, you, you see, obviously, Sid has his sister, Hannah, but we don't really see like a father figure in the house. And the, the two kids kind of seem like they're they're on their own, right? So the mom is like on the recliner, ass out which I can identify with because if I just got home from taking my kids to a place like Pizza Planet, I would also be exhausted. So I kind of don't blame her, but at the same time, you know, let's get the kids to bed. But so when you look around that room, you see the TV with an adjustable pliers on one of the dials. There's like empty soda cans on the floor, the garbage cans overflowing. You know, that room's a mess, right? And then you go to Sid's room, the desk, and I'm using air quotes there, uh, in his room is just a door on top of some sawhorses. He's also sleeping on the bed with no bed sheets. You know, that family definitely seems to be going through a rough time. But I got a question. Why do you think it's the mother? I thought it was the dad with the the, the deer head and the hunting motif and the hunting wallpaper. I thought it was an alcoholic father. And I, this just hit me. Maybe... Sid has all those padlocks on the inside of his door, not to keep his sister out, but his father's abusing him. It's to keep his dad, when he gets drunk watching TV, from coming in there and beating the shit out of him. It could be a valid point. The only reason why I was assuming mom was because I, at some point in time, I heard uh, like a mom's voice later on uh, in the next yeah. scene. I think she was calling for Hannah or something like that. So I think that's why I just assumed it was it was the mom. Yeah, one thing you'll learn, Drew, is no matter what TV show or movie we're watching, Big D will assume that the dad is beating the kid up. That's just <laughs> oh, what always – it always fucking happens. You know he's going up the <laughs> stairs to kick the shit out of that kid. That's so and, Like The guy will clearly say, like, I'm going to go to the attic and get the Christmas decorations. He's going to beat the fuck out of that kid. Well, he not, he, <laughs> he, he might be right. I mean, uh, and, and one of the things, right, so, you know, 
the 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 adjustable pliers are on the dials. Uh, and then when you go into uh, uh, into Sid's room, right? And also there's a couple of Easter eggs in this movie, which I thought were pretty great. Uh, and one of them was when they're in Sid's room, there was the Binford toolbox on top of Woody's crate. Uh, I'd love me some home improvement. So that was a neat little uh, add in there. But there's a lot of tools in general in the house. So maybe you're on to something there, Big D. Yeah, God knows a woman couldn't be using tools, you oh, assholes. God. Oh, my God. Where did you come in here? Who is this guy? <laughs> but the, I, I'm glad you guys brought up the Tim Allen thing because I shit you not. I watched this whole movie and thought that was George Clooney. Really? Yeah, it kind of looks like George Clooney. The chin and all? Uh, guess what? Fucking Tom Hanks does not look like a cowboy. Not in your dreams. <laughs> okay. But uh, getting back to Buzz, one of the things that I noticed in the writing credits as this movie opens is that you've got Joel Cohen as one of the writers, and then also Joss Whedon. So uh, people are familiar with Joss Whedon from doing the Avengers movies, but prior to that, um, he was the creator of uh, Above the Vampire Slayer, and one of my favorite TV shows. And he's just a a phenomenally talented director, writer. Uh, He also did A Cabin in the Woods. And what Joss did that was critical to this movie is he kind of made Buzz the character that he is. He originally Buzz Lightyear was supposed to be like this dim witted sort of Dudley do right sort of character. And uh, Joss was like, no, 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 no. He's not stupid. He just doesn't know that he's a toy. And therefore, he takes his job very seriously. And that's the comedy, not just that he's a dope. And so that epiphany turned the whole movie around and really created the chemistry between Buzz and Woody. He also vetoed the idea. One of the ideas that was being bounced around was that let's make this a musical. And Joss Whedon's like, no, this is not a musical. Yeah, he should have vetoed that Randy Newman song that came on right after Buzz (laughs) found out that he actually wasn't a toy. (laughs) One of the best parts about that song is it's talking about like (laughs) failing to fly or whatever. And then at the end, as Buzz is laying there on the ground all mangled, he's like, and I'll never sail again. And Carrie Gross is like, (laughs) What the fuck is he even singing about? This guy's trying to fly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> fuck Randy Newman. <laughs> All right. So Buzz and Woody try to make it to the moving truck, but Sid's dog Scud sees them and gives chase. Buzz gets left behind while saving Woody from Scud, and Woody tries rescuing him with Andy's radio-controlled car. Thinking that Woody is trying to eliminate RC as well, the other toys attack and toss him off the truck. Having evaded Scud, Buzz and RC retrieve Woody and continue to chase the truck, but RC's batteries become depleted, stranding them. Woody ignites the rocket on Buzz's back and manages to throw RC into the truck before Woody and Buzz soar into the air. Buzz opens his wings to free himself from the rocket before it explodes, gliding with Woody to land safely into a box in the van right next to Andy. Yeah, so a couple of things here. So when Woody makes it to the moving truck and he gets inside, that truck is actually relatively empty. There's a lot of empty room towards the back of that truck there. And they have a decent sized house, right? I would venture a guess that the truck would most likely be packed. So when when my family and I, we moved to Pennsylvania two years ago, our previous house wasn't that big, maybe the same size, maybe a little bit smaller than uh, Andy's family's house. And our truck was packed to the brim mm-hmm. with with just stuff. Those movers were like damn Tetris masters. They were like they had like a model for like how things would like should get moved in. It was it truly was a work of art. Those guys were amazing. But moving in general just sucks big time. That when we moved out here, it was an absolute mess. We moved. By the way, uh, a, a note to everybody out there: don't move two days after Christmas. That's like the worst <laughs> no. thing you could probably ever do. <laughs> I feel like the best part about moving around Christmas, though, is that you don't have to get anybody a gift. You just be like, congratulations, we got a new house. Hey, everybody. (laughs) Everybody gets to enjoy this gift. I had a friend, Jason. I've been really good at moving. We moved a lot when I was a kid. I think we moved. I went like six different elementary schools. We were always moving and, uh, you know, running from the Iranian government. And uh, and basically, like, I, I became a pro at this. And then I realized there are people who don't know how to move. And they're the weirdest ones. So I had this friend, Jason, who had me help him move. And we got to his house and nothing was in boxes yet. And I was like, no, 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 dude. When you ask your friends to help you move, your shit's already packed. We're just putting it in the truck and then lifting it. And then the other thing he did is once we got to his house, I was like, dude, you moved a lot of garbage to your new place. Don't you want to start fresh? He goes, yeah, I'm going to sort through it all and get rid of some stuff. Motherfucker, do that before you move it. Shit, yeah. (laughs) I'll tell you, I've, I've always been the first person to help when people are moving. So when we finally bought our house and we were moving out of our third floor condo, 
and my wife was seven and a half months pregnant. I put the call out. I had 22 people show up. Wow. And I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be cake. We're going to do this in two hours. Fuck no. Six hours later, 22 people it took to get all of our shit from a third floor down. I look at the pictures from that day and I'm just like, thank you <laughs> to have those friends that day. It was it was one of the greatest gifts I could have ever got. Big D, you got to move first and then give them beer. Not the other way around. You fucked it up. <laughs> no, I, I did give them beer at the end. Otherwise, it would have taken 12 hours. Yeah, uh, another quick note. Uh, make sure you guys label your boxes when you move. <laughs> we, we labeled most of them, but there were a handful that I don't think I, I got to. Yeah, so just just label them. This has been Moving Talk with Drew. <laughs> Shout on moving. Any tips on a tape? What kind of tape you should use? Uh, as a matter of fact. <laughs> All right, so uh, this point in the movie, I want to remind everybody, this is 1995, and they drop Scud as the dog name, which I thought was hilarious. Mm. Uh, for those people who are too young to remember, Scuds were uh, missiles that were Ooh. the kind of mainstay of the Iraqi military. No, you're, ro- you're wrong on where that name came from. Do you remember we did a Christmas story and I said that Scud Farkas reminded me of the kid in Toy Story? They named the dog after Scud Farkas. Oh, Scud Farkas was the kid that's like yes. Sid. Yes, it's him. Nah, it's Iraqi missiles. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what? They named the dog after Saddam's fucking weapons of mass destruction? Yeah, he kind of looks like a he kind of looks like a rocket. I heard the dog say Alu Akbar like two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> but he but the dog is perhaps the most egregious flaw in the animation of this movie like it looks like it came from another movie you know what it reminds me of is the dog from the fucking dire straits like money for nothing video mm. it's all just like blocky and shitty mm. the barks don't match up with the mouth movement like how did pixar get this so wrong the rendering is weird the movement is weird it literally looks like they took cells from a different movie and just slapped them into this bad scud bad Bad. Yeah, I want my MTV. Wasn't that that song? Right, money for nothing. Yeah, yeah, money for nothing. Yeah, and and with all that attention to detail too, right? One besides Scud, one nitpicky thing I noticed was that you know even though Andy drags Woody all around all over the place, Woody's hat still magically stays on. Like there's no way that thing stays on when they have that rocket strapped to their ass and they're flying down the street. It, it stays on. I don't understand that. But then. Somehow, towards the end, when Bo Peep makes out with him, then his hat falls off. So, uh, I don't know. That bugged me. Maybe the hat was like a metaphor for Woody's <laughs> That's what I thought, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I lost my hat. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeehaw! Yeah, so they're, so they're flying down the street, and the life of a toy is predicated on, on the, the utmost importance of humans not realizing that you're alive. Toys around the world, right? Even when Buzz goes into his depression, he doesn't walk out and start talking to the drunk dad or the kid. He's whenever people come around, he'll lay there still. He honors the rights. He honors the cause. But Buzz, Woody and RC, they're just throwing fucking just just shit to the wind. They don't care. They're weaving through traffic in plain sight of dozens of cars. You got a moving truck with the lift gate up in the air, and there's about 20 toys screaming at the top of their lungs. I'm pretty sure the toys like secret life around the world is blown. Well, I mean, I could see if you were going down the street and you saw an RC car with some toys on it, you'd be like, oh, maybe somebody's driving that thing. It doesn't mean... You know that they're that they're uh, clearly people. That they're what, what about the potato head frantically waving? Woody, Woody. Yeah, but it looks like it's a it's a moving vehicle, so it looks like it's just <laughs> bouncing around. I don't know. Listen, I think the best explanation for it is that they just they they don't care anymore. They just got to get to Andy. That's all that matters. And so you know, the rules go out the window. To quote, "It's always sunny in Philadelphia." What are the rules? On Christmas Day at their new house, Woody and Buzz stage another reconnaissance mission to prepare for the new toy arrivals. One of the toys is a Mrs. Potato Head, much to Mr. Potato Head's delight. As Woody jokingly asks what might be worse than Buzz, they discover Andy's new gift is a puppy, and the two share a worried smile. And this is where I make my PSA, guys. I'm a dog lover. I've rescued dogs. i fostered dogs. I volunteer at the Arizona Animal Welfare League. Don't get puppies for your kids. Kids do not appreciate 
their dogs. I remember I was a kid. I was like, mom, give me a dog, please. I love it. I'll take care of blah, blah, blah. A kid Andy's age wants a dog as a curiosity, but he's going to be much more enthralled with his toys and his gadgets. Woody has nothing to worry about. Uh, But parents, this is my advice to you. If you want a dog, go for it. Don't get your kid a puppy. They won't give a shit. It's, It's work. They don't want it. And always adopt. Don't shop. Yeah. Do you guys remember as a kid always wondering when they would be like, well, this movie had to be edited down or this movie's too long. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about, adults? Like, why would anyone want a shorter movie when they all cost the same to watch? I was like, three hour movie. Great. It's more movie for the dollar. Now, like, sadly, as an adult, I understand it. I get restless sometimes. Movies tend to stagnate. I get really picky about like how fast they're moving. Dude, 80 minutes is a great amount of time for a movie. It is fucking perfect. You're not sick of it. You're left wanting more. So I am now a big believer in the 90 minute movie. I think it's a perfect length, an hour and a half and wrap it the fuck up and let's move it on. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Also, it depends like what they're covering too. like the Laura rings and those they're what, like, like three and a half hours each. And, you know, they, there is a lot of walking. They do a lot of walking in their freaking movie. I get it. But trying to do that in 90 minutes, I don't know. But this movie, absolutely perfect. The way the timing was. Yeah, I think also it's it's not like a normal film here when you're generating all the images and you talk about how long the computing power in 95 took to compile all of this data to get the motion down. It must have been in the thousands of hours. Yeah, and you have to tip your cap to the animators on this film, right? 27 animators worked on the film using 400 computer models to animate the characters. And when they were finishing the animation, you know, depending on the complexity of it, each frame took from 45 minutes to 30 hours to render. So I'm not sure if, you know, if any of your listeners have used programs like, uh, like Adobe Dimension, but the, the Pixar animators are legit. The film required 800,000 machine hours, to your point, Big D. Uh, and was 114, a little over 114,000 frames in all. So uh, I know we're never going to, you know, I'll never say never, but uh, most likely we probably won't do Toy Story 2 for quite a long time. Uh, and since you're talking there about animation and the work that went into it, I had always remembered hearing a rumor that Toy Story 2 almost got deleted. So I was like, you know what, let me go look it up. And yes, it is true that when they were doing the second film, Most of the programmers used either Unix or Linux machines to render the graphics. And somebody accidentally hit a deletion command, which is RM star, which then as fast as possible starts to delete files. And they did this on the server storing all the data. They lost 90% of the finished film in 20 seconds. And it was less than a year away from its release. So they're they're like, whoa, it's all right. We got backups. You know, (laughs) we got backups. Let's go get the tape. The IT department comes down, and unfortunately, Pixar hadn't been doing tests on their backup protocol, so they hadn't been backing up correctly for the last three months. There was a critical error. There was no backups. A year away from the films being released, they had nothing. And then luckily, one of the uh, technical directors who had just had a child, she said, I think last week I took a copy of the film home to work. They immediately rushed over to her house. Crisis was averted simply because this technical director took a computer home with a copy to work. If that didn't happen, Toy Story 2 never would have happened. And you guys thought women didn't use tools. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. She nailed it. Where did you come from? Roger leaves and all of a sudden you're like up on your soapbox? <laughs> But seriously, the uh, th- that's an incredible story. And Big D, like when you and I record a podcast and we get an hour of audio in the bag and then there's like that brief moment where we think there was a technical issue and we might have oh. lost a file. It's like, I want to go jump out a fucking window. I want to blow my brains out. And this is <laughs> this is that to like the you know times a thousand. Mm-hmm. I cannot fucking believe that they lost 90 percent of the movie. I mean, they'd have to scrap it, right? There's no way they can make that up. No way that they said it would have taken uh, 30 people working 12 hours a day for a full year to catch back up where they were. But they were looking at the actual the, the rendering machines and then Woody's hat disappeared. Poof. Then his boots disappeared. Then Woody disappeared. And they were panicking. And they tell a story about like they're screaming down to the server room, unplug the servers. And the guy's like, we can't unplug it. <laughs> and they unplug the giant servers and there was 10% there. They were like, we're fucked. I mean, we're in the the tens of millions of dollars. You would have had 20 people out of work. 
Now, this is definitely a, a legit business reason to allow people to work from home more often. I'm all for it. Um, but yeah, and, and, and thanks to the big success that Toy Story was, Pixar is able to give us movies like, obviously, Toy Story 2, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, which I love Finding Nemo. My kids absolutely love that movie. And that's a, another great movie that's good for you know, children and adults. Cars, uh, Ratatouille. I love Ratatouille. That's a good one, too. The Incredibles and Coco, amongst others. Uh, and also, guys, um, quick spoiler. If you watch Coco, just make sure you're busy for the last 10 minutes because, holy shit, gets me every time. Yeah. Yeah, I saw Coco uh, in the theater uh, with my girlfriend at the time, and whoa! Fuck, like I was, yeah. she was like, "Let's go see Coco," and I'm like, "Oh man, <laughs> no. I don't see an animated movie in the theater. I'm like, it's gonna be stupid." And I was like, "Oh god, <laughs> Grandma Coco!" <laughs> <laughs> Has Pixar made anything bad? Like, have they made a bad movie? Uh, the second Incredibles is <sighs> it was okay. It's be- it's better than it's better than some of the like B Disney movies that came out like uh, like Hercules or The Hunchback of Notre Dame, I think. Well, Hercules had some good soul music in it though. I like that. I like that Hercules. Uh what about what about uh Finding Dory? Was that good? Uh, it was okay. Uh, I remember I actually took my my oldest daughter to see that in theaters. It was okay. It was nowhere near as good as the first one, but it still wasn't bad. We watch it, you know, from time to time now. It's not. I wouldn't put it in our top ten list. I think they took the Cars series a little too long. There was like Cars one, two, three, four. Then there was like airplanes and cars, fire trucks and yeah. cars, trucks and cars, cars and boats seven. Shrek and cars go to Hanukkah. <laughs> Big D's worst night. Yeah. Sh- Shrek and cars, Ramadan. I don't remember. It was just some crazy plot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now is the time that we rate the movie on our chat meter uh, that goes from Zero Wipes, which is a perfect movie. It is a pristine animation of an army man, uh, complete with the plastic mold, looking beautiful. Uh, and Five Wipes is Andy's sister Molly, the thing of nightmares. It's a jump right into her sprawling maw of a mouth. Ugh. Fucking disgusting. Uh, we'll start with you, Big D. What is your shat score for Toy Story? I, I, I have to think. This started it all. The movie is quality. It's groundbreaking. It's It was the first completely computer generated movie it started a genre and it looks good i mean with the exception of the flaws of the human characters it looks it looks as good today i mean as you, if you put it side to side to like toy story 3 you'd be like oh it's awful but on its own it looks really good the storytelling as much as we think there's some darkness behind it once they get past the whole rivalry about who's going to be the dictator or king of the toys and Buzz and Woody team up. It's compelling. It's fun. There's enough there for adults to like it. Uh, it's it's enjoyable. It was innovative. People still universally love it. I think it was like a 99 on Rotten Tomatoes. It was something ridiculous. I got to give it a half wipe. It, it might not be your cup of tea, but you cannot contest how universally loved and the impact this movie had on kids movies and Hollywood as a whole. All right, respectable score from Big D, Dick Ebert. Uh, Drew, what's your chat score for Toy Story? Toy Story was such a departure from previous Disney films. You know, starting in the late 80s, when they started becoming relevant again, uh, there was The Little Mermaid, uh, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin, all largely kind of based around princesses for the most part. The Lion King kind of got away from that a little bit, but Toy Story, I think, took it to a whole new level. And... And both kept, you know, the kids and parents entertained, which most Disney movies up to that point really didn't do that much. You know, they catered really just to the kids. Uh, I would say the one big exception was Aladdin, uh, but that was, I think, mostly thanks to Robin Williams, Genie. He absolutely nailed that role. But the movie flew by at 81 minutes and the plot kept moving along. The animation of toys was fantastic. However, the animation of the people left a bit to be desired. Uh, But again, this was 1985. I'm sorry, 1995. Uh, Randy Newman didn't help my score mm-hmm. at all, but um, I'm not going to let him bring down all the hard work those 27 animators did. Uh, I, I feel like when compared to other kids' movies, this is a zero wipe, but in the grand scheme of things, on the Shat Pantheon, I think I had to agree with Big D and go uh, a half wipe here. All right, so Drew and Big D each with half a wipe. It's a very, very strong score, near perfect. 
Um, I've got to disagree a little bit and keep us grounded here. I think Toy Story is undoubtedly clever. It's very funny. It's appealing to people of all ages. But part of what we do with the podcast is seeing, does this hold up from our memories of of our childhood? Uh, is it still appealing today? And for me, it's still, at the end of the day, a kid's movie. And the curse of a kid's movie is that everything has to be familiar and dumbed down. So the movie's original parts, where it actually kind of pushes itself to be quirky, pushes itself to try something new, I think in those parts it really shines. But it is grounding itself in really, really familiar stuff that's very generic, very dumbed down, kind of old, tired jokes. Uh, The toys do look amazing for being 24 years old. Like That's just crazy to even think about, that this movie came out 24 years ago. But as you said, Drew, some of the other animation really feels thrown together. It was just kind of like an afterthought. I can't imagine that that's just an accident uh, that that animals and people and everything else look like shit. But the you know, but the renderings of the actual environments and the toy characters were so good. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, I did. I had a good time watching this. But would I watch it again without a child forcing me to? Absolutely not. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go through this movie again. I think twice in my life is is quite enough. And for me, I got to give it two wipes. Okay, I want to ask you this, though, Gene. Coming into it, you were cynical and you have that hardened heart. What did you expect to give this? I thought that I was going to give it a below average score, probably about three wipes uh, in that I thought that it was going to be I didn't think it was going to suffer from from necessarily poor animation, but just that the jokes were going to fall flat. And I found myself in the first 15 minutes being like, uh, uh, uh. and the, the joke that got me was, was again, one of those quirky, weird ones where Andy gets a lunchbox and a slinky dog's like, it's a lunchbox for lunch. <laughs> and that got me like, that's the kind of joke that makes me laugh. And so, you know, I'm, I'm dying there, but that was overshadowed by dumb shit. Like Mr. Potato Head kissing his own ass by putting his mouth on his hand. I'm like, Oh, I get it. Cause he's a potato head. That's, you know, it's shit like that. I, I didn't really like. So, so I would say I started off at like a, a three probably was my, my mindset going into it, but the animation just blew me away. And then I found myself laughing a bit. So I'd take it, you know, take a wipe off there. But again, you know, me with the stuff that's made for that generic audience, that's just supposed to be appealing to everybody. That's a real turnoff for me. Uh, if this were Aladdin, you're talking half a wipe for sure. Uh, but uh, Toy Story just just not quite there. So putting those scores together, half a wife, half a wife, and two wipes uh, makes three divided by the three of us. That is a one white movie for Toy Story. Big D, where does that put it in the pantheon of Shat? Uh, so that ties it now in the like eighteen spot with some very diverse movies: Empire Strikes Back, Conan the Barbarian, Rounders, Terminator. And Back to the Future 2. Saying that your animated movie is as good as Back to the Future 2 or Terminator, I think is is high praise. That is that is a very good movie. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I mean, obviously, Empire is a, a classic. All those movies are actually great movies. But I think when you look at like kids movies, I think Toy Story, it's it's one of the best ever from like the, the kid movie standpoint. I feel like that's a good spot for it. Yeah, and I, and I think that you brought up a good point, Drew, that this was a transition from Disney's classic look and feel of the hand-drawn animation to, I mean, you couldn't have done movies like uh, Inside Out or some of these newer ones that push more adult themes or the vibrance of Coco or Cars. It opened up an entirely new world. It deserves some credit for that, but it's also, it's, it's a good movie. It's something you could sit with your kids and not want to claw your eyes out. Yeah, I certainly meant no disrespect to the history of this movie and and how it changed film. I'm talking strictly based on how it holds up for me. Um, I think that that ranking among the 106 movies that uh, we have done is is very respectable and uh, and definitely the highest ranking we have for an animated film. So way to go, Toy Story. That closes out Toy Story. Before we move on to the next movie we're going to do, I've got a couple of shout outs to read. If you'd like to hear your name on the podcast, just go to shatthemovies.com, put your name in the shout outs box, and as a thank you, we will read your name on the podcast. This week's shout outs go out to James Howell, Oscar, Liz, Ryan Trainer, Valerie, BTT Fan, and Clipped Huevos. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. And again, if you'd like to hear your name on the podcast, <laughs> go to shatthemovies.com and put your name in the shout out box. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? 
So next week, we have a category that when we started the category, it was six, I mean, killer films, the best of Arnold Schwarzenegger. So the contestants for best of Arnold Schwarzenegger was The Last Action Hero. We already did it. Twins, The Running Man, True Lies, Total Recall, and The Predator. We already did The Predator. So this week, folks, you only got four movies it could be. Twins, Running Man, True Lies, or Total Recall. All very strong movies, so it's going to be an exciting week. All right, that concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. On Facebook, you can search for Shat the Movies Podcast. The website is shatthemovies.com. Our email address is host at shatthemovies.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can donate through PayPal, Venmo, or Amazon. Just go to shatthemovies.com slash PayPal, Venmo, or Amazon. And if you'd like to help us with sponsorships, we have a survey at shatthemovies.com slash survey. That helps us match up with the best sponsors for our audience. Where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please be sure to leave a review. That helps the podcast grow. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, True Detective, and We Just Started American Gods. You can find all that information on our website, shatontv.com. Thanks, Big D, for joining me on this podcast, as always. And Drew, thanks so much for being our special guest. Where can people find you to hear more of your podcast? Yeah, thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. I had a good time talking about this movie. Uh, so my podcast, the One Headlight 90s podcast, can be found on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And you can find me on Twitter at 1HL Podcast, uh, number 1HL Podcast, or you can drop me an email one headlight podcast at gmail.com. And guys, I just was talking to Drew uh, off the air and he loves trolls. <laughs> so if you're a Twitter troll, go find him. What was that? What was that uh, Twitter <laughs> handle again? <laughs> oh, please send them my way. It's at one HL podcast. Number one HL podcast. Love to talk to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Also, I want people to know because the timing here is kind of bad, right? Drew's going to seem like he assassinated Roger Roper. They're going to think that Drew has been (laughs) plotting this the entire time. This was set up months ago, right? We're recording in in the past a little bit. So it just happens that Roger decided to step away. It's not Drew's fault. So trolls, do not attack Drew. (laughs) If you love Roger Roper, do not attract Drew. It's not his fault. It's just bad timing. (laughs) Yeah. All four of you refrain All four of you Roger Roper fans, please refrain from (laughs) tweeting at Drew. You hear me, Gillian? All right. Anyway, we love you, Carmelita. Oh, Carmelita's the bomb. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, We will catch you next week for the following movie. Your mind. It is the center of your life. It is everything you hear. Everything you see. Everything you feel, it is everything you are. How would you know if someone stole your mind? Arrest that woman! Quaid. Cut. Get ready for a surprise. We can't let him run around. He knows too much. They've got your bug. I get a lock. There! And the bug's in your skull. Ah! Take this thing out of the case and stick it up your nose. Don't worry, it's self-guiding. Got him. I lost him. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here. Look who's talking. You erased your identity and implanted a new one. If I'm not me, who the hell am I? He's got a hologram! Welcome to Johnny Cab. Drive. Where can I take you tonight? Please fasten your seatbelt. 
I want Quaid delivered alive for reimplantation. That's for making me come to Mars. You wouldn't hurt me. After all, we're married. Consider that a divorce. Hope you enjoyed the ride. Emma. Sit her on your lap for the whole podcast. Come here. Yeah, get her a mic. Yeah, just get her a mic. She recorded <laughs> one with me about True Detective. Yeah, it was great. Okay. So, Emma, what's what's Aww. the problem here? I'm scared. Why are you scared? Aww. I want you. You want me? Yeah. Aww. Okay. <laughs> I'm scared I want him too. <laughs> what is it you're scared of? <laughs> what is it you're scared of? <laughs> There's no reason for you to be scared. Okay. Do you ever see monsters in the regular day? Do you? Do you ever see monsters? No? Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's a good that's a good bit of snot right on that one. <laughs> yes. yes i'm sorry i really appreciate it okay, there I'm no no it's fine. fine man yeah take care take care of emma two two seconds okay so come here listen <laughs> listen come. Come, here. come here listen what's the matter why are you scared this is gonna be a great radio you what mom mommy's coming home very soon did I get that all the time? They always want my wife. I'm like, but I'm pretty. I mean, I'm pretty good too. Hot. I'm dead. Yeah. What about me? What the fuck? I, I my dog prefers me to anybody else, so it works out really well. <laughs> like I'm an equal participant in this household. Why don't you like hanging out with me?